Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Today, another installment of our teaching series, The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. Some stories in the Bible are easy to climb into and, and experience. We can really feel them and relate to them. Some characters in the Bible, they're easy to relate to. When they feel something, I feel it too. I understand what they're going through. And today's story is one of those kinds of stories. There's a father by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. They leave their homeland, Bethlehem, in Judea, and they go to a foreign land of Moab, uh, trying to escape famine and make a life for themselves. Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judea. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two, two sons. These, two, uh, they, uh, these took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman, that's Naomi, the mom, the mother-in-law, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. All right, we'll stop there for a moment. By the way, there's a new book, the book of Ruth. Uh, it's, a, it's a brief but really, really fascinating uh, story. Uh, in this story, we have, we've got Naomi. She's, she's the mother-in-law. She's the mother, now a widow. Her two boys die. She's, she's a mother-in-law. She's got these two young ladies that she's now responsible for. And so Naomi, she determines that she is going to leave the land of Moab and go on home. Uh, she's going to, she's lost her husband. She's lost her boys. She's going to send her daughters-in-law back to their homes. And she's just going to go home and, and, and wait to die herself, I suppose. Uh, and so she attempts to send Orpah and Ruth uh, back to their parents uh, so that she can return to her home, Jerusalem, or, or Bethlehem in Israel. Uh, Naomi's misery in, at this moment is, is palpable. It's, it's relatable. Sadly, uh, you too have experienced, some of you, the deep sort of misery that Naomi is experiencing right now. She's alone. And she's going to send her daughters-in-law back to their parents. And she's going to go back to her homeland. Verse 14, then they, that's Orpah and Ruth, the two daughters-in-law, they, they lifted up their voices and they wept. And Orpah that kissed Naomi, her mother-in-law, kissed her. But Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said, see your sister-in-law, Orpah, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people Back to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. You, you go too. Again, these are foreign women. I mean, they're, they're living in their homeland in Moab. But, but to an Israelite, these are foreign women, these, these daughters-in-law. Go, go back to your gods, back to your family, and I'm going to go back to my people and my God, Naomi says. Verse 16, but Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you. Or to return from following you? For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people. And, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything. But death parts me from you. The, the love of a daughter-in-law for her mother-in-law, a love, the love of one widow for another elderly widow. Verse 18 says, And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, 
she said no more. Astounding is the level of commitment that Ruth is making here to her mother-in-law. Culturally, we don't quite grasp this, so let me help you. Here's the story. Here's the, the backstory uh, or the context. Certainly, Ruth was agreeing to, in this commitment, agreeing to a destitute life. She's agreeing that she will be childless. She will be poor. She's going to be a foreign woman living in the nation of Israel. She's going to leave her Moabite homeland. Uh, she's going to leave the protection of her mother and father and, the, and, and her original family. She's going to learn a new language. She's going to learn new customs. And she's going to follow a new God. That is what she is saying or committing to when she says, Naomi, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow, follow you, mother-in-law. Now, I, I don't know, but, but perhaps, if you think on this, perhaps Ruth, who just a few years ago was, was a, a, a young bride, a new bride, uh, now her husband's deceased, she's a widow just a few years later, but, but a few years ago she was married to Naomi's son. I don't know, but perhaps uh, her now deceased husband just a few years ago, had told her about the God of the Bible, had told her about the God of, of the Jewish faith, had told her about the story of God parting the Red Sea and, 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 and the children of Israel escaping on dry land from the, the Egyptians who were pursuing them. I don't know, but perhaps just a few years ago, her, her now deceased husband had told her about the story of Joseph and how Joseph had been carried off as a slave to Egypt many years earlier, but how God took what, what other people meant for evil in the life of Joseph and turned it for good. And, and Joseph was a success story because God's hand was on Joseph. I don't know, but perhaps Ruth was holding on to the stories that her, her husband, now deceased, her husband had told her about the God of Israel, and perhaps she was just drawn back to the, to the homeland, drawn back to Naomi's home and Naomi's God. But let's not fool ourselves. This is going to be a tough ride for Naomi and for Ruth, both now widows, most certainly a, a life of, 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 of destitute, poverty-stricken sort of, sort of want. Um, in that culture, widows and unmarried women, they really had little hope outside of living either with their extended family or the other perhaps fallback would be a sordid sort of life like, like prostitution. And may that never be for Ruth. And, and so what hope is there for her and Naomi as they return vulnerable as widows as they return to Bethlehem in Israel? Well, there is one hope. And that's really the, the theme of today. Uh, the, 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 it, was, it was the hope of a family redeemer. What is a family redeemer? Well, this is an Israelite custom. In that day, when an Israelite husband died, his brother, well, the other brother died in this story as well, right? His brother or a near relative would marry that widow and continue the brother's name. And so that's what's going to go on today. A family redeemer uh, is going to come in, save the day, and this will be the hope for Ruth and the older lady, Naomi. And the family redeemer's name is Boaz. We're going to read about him today, but I want to introduce you to Boaz, a good man, the family redeemer, um, and let's continue on. Here's the story Obviously, we can't read all uh, the entire book of Ruth today. So here's the, uh, the summary of what happens next. Young Ruth, she's a widow, but she's still a young lady. Uh, she's back in Bethlehem now. She and, and, and Naomi are just barely scra scraping by, uh, just barely uh, making it. I mean, they, they just hand to mouth on a daily basis. They're finding food to eat, and the Lord is providing, but things are tight. And so Ruth, young Ruth, she finds herself now in in a field where the harvesters are, are picking grain. And they're, they're working the crops, they're picking the grain. And what Ruth is doing on this day, which, is, which was really pretty common for widows, she was going down 
the, the rows, the, the crops, after the workers would pick, whatever they would drop, she would pick up. And she would pick up the grain so that she could ultimately work the grain and make enough bread for her and her elderly mother-in-law. So she's out there working. I mean, this is hard, these are hard times. Slim pickings, as they say, because, because the, 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 the workers have already taken the crops. She's just picking up what little has been dropped. It kind of reminds me, living out in Bayview, as Lydia and the kids I do, and I do, uh, there, are, there are orchards, grapefruit orchards in Bayview. And every, every winter, when the workers come through and they pick the grapefruit, uh, it's quite a sight. They've got ladders and they've got long bags, and they just pick, 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 pick as fast as they can because, you know, time is money. And so they pick all that grapefruit, and they climb down, they go to the next tree. And what happens is, uh, and I understand how this happens, but they drop fruit. Well, you know what we do? After they go through the fields and they've, they've packed up all the fruit and, and, and it goes to the packing shed and they're gone, uh, we send our kids out there with a with a, a trailer, a little trailer, and they uh, like a little kids trailer, and they uh, they pick up the uh, the grapefruit. It just hit the ground, but it's still good. I said, kids, it's good. You stick your finger in. It. If it's not mushy, you put it you put it in the little trailer. And so they get a trailer load of a kids trailer load of of the fruit that's been left after the picking, and it's been dropped on the ground. And they put it in there, and they. They drag it back to the front door and we let it sit there for a while and we eat grapefruit that was just going to go to waste. It was just going to rot on the ground. That's really what's going on here. Ruth is, is slim pickings. She's picking up the grain that's been dropped on the ground to just make sure that she and her mother-in-law can have enough to eat for that day. Ruth 2. Oh, by the way, by the way, uh, by God's providence, she ends up in Boaz's field, the family redeemer. She doesn't even know who Boaz is yet, but she's picking in his field. Ruth chapter 2, then, then Boaz said to Ruth when he finds out what's going on, now listen, my daughter, and she doesn't even know who Ruth is, I mean, who, who Boaz is yet. Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field. Don't leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to, char not to touch you? Yeah, he has. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young women have drawn. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been, has been uh, fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge." Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. All right, so we, we're not going to, again, be able to read the entire story. So let me, let me just give you a little bit more of the summary of it. Uh, Boaz uh, sees uh, a woman that is not part of his work crew, uh, a woman out there uh, picking. He, he, he can determine just based on the circumstances, that's a widow who is that? And his workers tell him, oh yeah, that's Ruth. You know, she's helping out Naomi uh, or taking care of Naomi. Uh, and so he realizes what's going on. And he tells this young lady, look, you only work my field. You work other fields. Uh, the men may take advantage of you. You only work my field. Uh, you, you, want, you want water? You go drink from my water source. You stay with my people. And, and I've told my men to protect you and not take advantage of you. And then we didn't read it in the story, but it's, it's, in, it, it's in there. In the book of Ruth, then he tells his workers, look, when you're picking, be, be a little less careful. In other words, drop a little more on the ground. Pick some of the, the grain out and throw it on the ground and let Ruth pick it up. Don't, don't, don't withhold from her. In fact, give her a little extra. Okay, so, so now what's going on is uh, Naomi, the mother-in-law, knows that Boaz is this family redeemer. Uh, and uh, Boaz also knows he is potentially a family redeemer. And, and, then, and then Ruth finds out, oh, Boaz is, is, is working on a plan here. 
He's working on a plan. Uh, so, so the story goes that Boaz decides, I'm, I'm going to redeem Ruth. I'm going to redeem Ruth. Uh, I'm going to take her as my wife. I'm going to care for her. I'm going to care for her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, for a lifetime. Uh, but there's one catch. And that catch is that there was one other close relative in town. Uh, he was actually a closer relative. And another man who could redeem Ruth if he wanted to. Another man who could, who could buy the field and, and, or, or could, 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 could pay the, the money to, to say, Ruth will now be my wife, uh, Naomi will now be my mother-in-law, and I will continue on that family name. Uh, and so Boaz, Boaz has to deal with the fact that there is one other family kinsman who's in line ahead of him. Ruth chapter 4 says this, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, the gate of the, of the town, and behold, the Redeemer... Um, this, this other redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and he sat down and, and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and he said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he, Boaz, he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it. Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. Boaz goes on. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he, the other, the other gentleman, said, I will. I will redeem it. All right. Stop there for a moment. So, now, Boaz has a problem. Boaz wants to be the family redeemer. Boaz wants to take Ruth as his wife, but this other family redeemer, a closer relative, has determined he is going to do so. So Boaz, quick thinking, he explains. He explains to the family member, since you are going to acquire the family property, you are obligated to also take responsibility for the widows, for Ruth, for Naomi, and... When Ruth bears a child, you will be responsible for dividing up your inheritance to account for this new blended family. Well, the other, the other family, the other potential redeemer, he says to Boaz, nope, nope, I can't do it. I can't do that. It's going to mess up my retirement plan. It's going to uh, mess up my inheritance plan plan that my family has already put in place. I change my mind. I do not want to be the family redeemer. Ruth 4 verse 13, happy ending. So Boaz took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he were her own. The Naomi, or I'm sorry, the, the neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of the great King David. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right. There's some interesting aspects to the story that I want to unpack for you today that Maybe, you, maybe you're unaware of. Maybe you didn't glean from just this reading. First, let's, let's dive a little deeper on this, this character, Boaz, this family redeemer. Why was he so motivated? Was it because he saw Ruth and, and she perhaps was beautiful to him? It doesn't say any of that, but she was a foreign woman. And what was the attraction? What was his motivation? And and yeah, perhaps, perhaps it, was, it was her beauty. It's not, that's not mentioned. Perhaps there was something there, but 
But there's an aspect to the story that, that maybe you didn't pick up on, uh, certainly not from just this cursory reading. Um, now, now, Boaz was clearly a wealthy man. Well, Boaz had um, employees and a, and, a, and a business, and, and surely, surely Boaz was, in a sense, a good catch. He, he could have had a, a, a wife from his homeland. He chose to marry Ruth. Well, here's, here's the rest of the story. Boaz, um, either mother or grandmother, sometimes in the writing of genealogies in the Bible, they, they would leave out, leave out one step in the genealogy. But Boaz, either mother or grandmother, was a lady by the name of Rahab. Do you remember Rahab's story? Boaz's mother was Rahab. Do you remember Rahab's story? Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute who lived in another country. She actually lived, lived in, a, in a walled, gated city known as Jericho. And she could have, probably should have, died with all the other inhabits of, inhabitants of, of Jericho. Uh, she was a nameless, faceless, foreign woman. But God chose to rescue her. God chose to redeem her. And, and pull her out of that city and, and, and use her uh, in the story, the history of Israel. Though she was a foreign woman, a prostitute, God used Rahab, brought her into the camp, into the nation of Israel, this foreign woman. And that Rahab, she was Boaz's mom. I just wonder if Boaz saw Ruth one day and thought, that's like my mom. My, my mom was, was a foreigner. My mom was vulnerable. People could have, could have taken advantage of my mother, but, but the Lord in his, in his sovereignty, God in his, in his crazy secret plan, he redeemed my mother. And I'm here today because my mother Rahab was, was saved, was redeemed. I wonder if he looked at Ruth and he thought of his mother and he thought, I'm going to, I'm going, to, I'm going to carry on that family tradition. I'm going to redeem Ruth. So that's a beautiful story. That's, that's, it's a beautiful story of how God, in his sovereignty, in his sometimes secret plan that we don't even see, how he, he delights to, to rescue and, and redeem and, and, and save. And it's a beautiful story, but, but where is Jesus in this story, I, you know, this, this, this sermon series, I've, I've, been, I've been compelling you to believe that the story of, of Jesus, what we call the great exchange, the story of Jesus' redemption plan, it's, it's in every story, every book of the Bible. And so I promise, that, I promise you that we're going to find that. So where is it in this story? And to that, uh, for that, we're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 1. It's a passage that you might, might find a little sleepy because it's, it's the story of the genealogy, the ancestry of Jesus. Now, we're going to have about 14 different, uh, different, na uh, different generations mentioned. There might be some that are, are left out. We don't know. But, but we're going to have generation after generation after generation uh, all the way through to the birth of Jesus. That's Matthew chapter 1. And in that, typically when you get a genealogy in the Bible, in that day and age, they would name father after father after father after father, a long, sleepy reading. That's probably how you normally uh, view the genealogies in the Bible. But, but the beauty, the intrigue of the, this genealogical entry, uh, as, we, as we see the family tree that led to Jesus, the intrigue for me is, like, how, is God, how does God want us to know, um, see, view the family tree of Jesus? Who will God highlight? Which names will be pulled out that we might look at them a little more closely? Uh, the family tree of Jesus. There's a connection here, and we'll see that in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 I've underlined the names of five individuals, all women. Take note of that. 
genealogies typically record the name of the males, father after father after father. I've, I've underlined five names. Take note of that. Matthew 1, verse 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. I've underlined Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab was the father of uh, Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, from our story, whose mother was Rahab. Underline that. Boab was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And then if we skip all the way down to verse 16, uh, we, we, we read once again that, that Jesus, the Christ child, was born to Mary. Five names. Only five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Now what's intriguing to me is, who do you think God determined the spotlight in this in his genealogy. This is important. Who does, what does he want us to know about his family tree? And there are five ladies. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, do you know what is uh, common with all of these women? All of the women that we read... The, 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 whose names we just read, are, uh, the, the, they're all familiar because they have all been labeled as whore, hooker, foreigner, trash, used goods, loose, women of ill repute. Every one of them, all five of them. Tamar, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, Tamar slept with her father-in-law and had a child by him. Rahab, uh, uh, Boaz's mother, was a prostitute, a foreigner in the, in the walled city of Jericho. Ruth, we read, at, read about today, this foreign woman that comes from Moab, Bathsheba, remember her story? Uh, she was married to a commoner, a soldier, King David. She, she hooks up with King David. They have an affair, and then they, they plot to kill her husband so that she can come and live in the harem of King David. And then Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, she was certainly not immune to name-calling. Uh, I'm, I'm having a baby, but I'm a virgin. Yeah, right, Mary. That's what she heard all the time for nine months. All five of them. Considered women of ill repute, foreign trash. Now, as I've said, genealogy is customarily focused on fathers, but a few notable mothers would be included carefully, judiciously, to color the story of a person's life and family tree. So there, there were you know, over a dozen, perhaps dozens of women to choose from when, when God wrote his genealogy in the book of Matthew, but God God chose to highlight these five women. Of all that he could have chosen from, he chose to highlight these five women. Now, most families tend to conceal the more disgraceful people, uh, tend to hide the more disgraceful events in their family tree. But Jesus, he was pleased to highlight perhaps the, the five most scandalous women in his family tree. Why? Well, I believe it to be because God delights to deliver his children from shame. And God delights to highlight, to, to, to magnify the majesty of his grace in the process. The Lord wants to take from you your disgrace and cover it 
with his grace. He loves to take something broken and and make it beautiful again. God God is in the business of making uh, foreigners his children, taking enemies and, and making them friends. He loves to, as Romans chapter 8 Verse 28 says he loves to to, to take all things and work all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's what the Lord wants to do in your life. Take all things and and work them together for good for you. Each of these women depicts a separate story of God's grace woven throughout life the stories of the Old Testament. The theme for this year is is God's great exchange woven throughout the entire Bible. That's what we see. God takes the disgrace in our lives and he replaces it with the, the righteousness of Christ. Our disgrace for his grace. Our sin and brokenness for the righteousness of Christ. All of these, every one of these ladies' stories is an illustration of what God would later uh, speak into St. Peter's life. Uh, When St. Peter was like not wanting to hang around with with Gentiles, not Jewish, people who aren't Jewish, and and Peter was wanting to not eat uh, the the non-Jewish food. He wanted to be a rule keeper. And and, uh, God says to him in, in Acts 10, Verse 15, he says to Peter, do not call unclean, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And that's what he's saying in the genealogy with Tamar, who who slept with her father-in-law, and and Rahab, who was a prostitute, and and Ruth, who was a foreign Moabite woman, and, and Bathsheba, who cheated on her husband and eventually had him killed and and Mary the virgin mother of Jesus uh, God's message is I've made this these women clean don't you dare call them unclean I've covered them with my grace I have exchanged their sin and brokenness for the righteousness of Christ I delight I delight to take brokenness and make it new again. I, I delight to take foreigners and, and make them my children. I, I delight to take people who are not my people and make them my people. That's, that's the business of the Lord. That's what he does. So, what do we have here? We have a picture of Boaz being a family redeemer. He swoops in and saves Naomi and Ruth. Bigger picture, if we zoom out of it bigger picture jesus is our family redeemer that's what jesus went to the cross to do to say those people who are not my people i will make them my people those people who who have reputations and and are just filled with disgrace I will wash them clean. I will make them new again. I will put my righteousness on them. We will see them in a new light. God says, don't you look at something that I have made clean and call it unclean. It is clean. I have made it clean. In your life, in my life, who do I look at and say, how disgusting, unclean. Do I, have a right, do, I, do I have any right to do that? Maybe it's when you look in the mirror. Maybe you're just too hard on yourself. You look at yourself and you say, and I'm, I'm just trash. I'm, I'm such a disgrace. And God speaks into your life and he says, no, no, don't, don't call unclean what I have made clean. Two big ideas, just in summary, they're really summary ideas from this whole story today. I bet because you're a perceptive, uh, close listener, I bet you already got these. But two big ideas, two summary ideas. Um, Maybe you want to write them down. Number one, the Lord delights to deliver his children in hard times. 
I mean, Ruth is going to leave her foreign land. She's going to leave her mom and dad. She's going to follow a widow, a widow following a widow, going to a land she's never been to speak a language she doesn't know and follow a God she's never met and learn customs that she's never practiced. But the Lord delights to deliver his children in hard times. You know what that means? That means there's such freedom in which we can live. As, as children of God, there, there's great freedom to be found living under the sovereignty of God. He, he loves to work mightily, mightily for his children. In times of trial, uh, times of difficulty, uh, you know, the fact that the Lord delights to work in our lives, it, it brings a freedom and a joy that, that cannot be shaken even in difficult times. We can say our Lord has a track record of showing up in the middle of difficulty times. I will not be shaken. What that means is that if God calls, you can make radical commitments. If God calls, you can, you can take on new adventures. And if the Lord leads, you can simply be faithful long term to a commitment that you have already made. Knowing that the Lord is working on your behalf, no one can stop him in his doing of good in your life. No one can stop him. No one can thwart his plans, his good plans. When, when the unstoppable force that is the Lord meets the hard times in your life that you're experiencing maybe even right now, Guess who gives up first? Not the Lord. The Lord pushes through. The, the difficult times, ultimately, they have to concede. They have to give way. Because the work of the Lord is unstoppable. You think Ruth followed Naomi knowing exactly how this was all going to turn out? Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Uh, but, the, but, but the God... Of, of Israel that, that her deceased husband had told her about, perhaps she thought to herself, like, what if I meet him in this new land? This God that I've heard so much about, what if he delivers me the way he delivered his other children? What if that becomes my story? I'm not part of his people, but what if he makes me part of his people? You see, the Lord delights to deliver his children in hard times. Trust the Lord today. He will, he will carry you through. The unstoppable force that is the Lord, he will push through your difficulties and your tragedies and your hard times, and they will have to give way. In summary, there's, there's a second big idea, and that is this. The Lord delights to deliver his children from the shame of a broken past. The Lord delights to deliver his children from the shame of a broken past. Are you feeling that shame today? Have you to date still been unwilling to, to let go of the reputation and, and the disgrace and, 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 and the past sins and, and, and the junk that was your life? Maybe it's more current than that. Maybe you just feel incompetent. Maybe you feel second class. Some of us would say, you know, it's not what other people think about me. It's that I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. I'm, I'm embarrassed by who, who I am. Here's the truth, my friends. The Lord delights in magnifying the majesty of of his grace in you. If you're having a hard time with your past, if, if you're having a hard time with who you are right now, then there's shame, and there's disgrace, and there's disappointment, and there's embarrassment. Know this, the Lord delights to deliver his children from shame. The Lord delights to deliver his children from brokenness makes him look good, makes his children happy. And that's, that's the nature of a good daddy. He wants to see his children happy. 
Rest in that today, my friends. Rest in the goodness of the Lord. Amen. As we come to the end of our time together today, I want to encourage you to, 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 to bow your head in prayer now. Maybe, maybe all by yourself. Maybe right there with your closest friends or loved ones. Uh, or maybe in a room of three, four, or five people. Maybe you still want to pray by yourself silently and, and deal with these two big ideas. Number one, maybe right now you are in the midst of difficulty, hardship, trial, disappointment. I want you to rest in the goodness of the Lord. I want you to bow your heads and just take a moment and say, Lord, I trust you. I trust that, that you as an unstoppable force are going to butt heads with my, my difficulty, uh, my disappointment, and you will win out, Lord. You will, you will win the day. You will carry me through. Tell him that. Tell him, I'm trusting you today, Lord, that, that you're going to make all things good. You, you, you're going to get me through this. I'm gonna, it's a difficult time, but I'm going to rest in you. I will not be shaken, Lord. My, my faith is in you, your sovereignty. You will, you will win the day. You will carry me through this. I, I'm trusting that. And then the second big idea, maybe right now, it's not so much your current circumstance, but it's just the fact that you feel shame. You feel disappointment. Maybe your, your sense of self-esteem is just, just as low as it could be. I want you to bow your head and I want you to say, Lord, I want to find my esteem in you. I want, I want, I want to be defined by you, Lord. Uh, I want to rest in the fact that, 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 that you call me good, that you call me righteous, Lord, that you see potential in me that maybe I don't even see myself. Tell the Lord that. Lord, Lord, deliver me from my shame. Deliver me from my disappointment in myself. Deliver me from my embarrassment. And then maybe these are the key words. Say this to the Lord. Say, Lord, give me eyes to see myself the way you see me. That's my prayer for you. That, that you would have eyes to see yourself in all the truth and beauty that you, be, you would have eyes to see yourself the way the Lord sees you. My friends, sometimes, sometimes you're harder on yourself than the Lord is. See yourself in the, in the truth and the beauty, the lens through which God sees you today as this child, all, all cleaned up, made new again, righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Rest in that. It has been so good to be with you today. I'm just, I'm just touched that you've invited me into your home. We continue to make these uh, videos, these sermons online, make them available online because we know that some of you are continuing to self-isolate and we respect that. You go with your conscience. I do want to tell you that Holy Week is coming. It's a few weeks away and, and I, I'm expecting that some more of you are going to be back here and we're going to start filling these chairs and filling this space. Holy Week is going to be an awesome week. Uh, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Good Friday, every, every day of Holy Week, we're going to open this space up for, for, for a, just a quiet time of prayer at noon during the lunch hour from 12 to 1. There'll be soft music playing in here, just playing lightly, and the space will be uh, just quiet and solemn and safe, and you can come in. I'll be here just praying on the front row. You can come in and sit wherever you want and, and just pray quietly all of Holy Week. It's such a special week. It's such a special time for us to prepare our hearts. And so Holy Week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at noon, and then, and then on Wednesday of that week, we're also going to have a special prayer time in the evening. Maybe you can't make it during the noon hour. You can come at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And again, a quiet space, a safe space for you to pray silently by yourself or maybe in a, in a small group of two or three people. Then Holy Week, I'm um, sorry, Good Friday of Holy Week uh, is going to be a special time in which we're going to come in here at 7 and we're going to have a, a really traditional service, Stations of the Cross, as we read through the story of Jesus' last days and his crucifixion. It's a somber story, a very dramatic story, and so there's going to be a dramatic reading and some music. But before that, 
5.30 p.m., we're gonna have tacos out on the lawn, actually out in the parking lot. As you, as you come in, before you enter into our space, we're gonna have a taco station and tables and chairs and water bottles. We're gonna have a good, uh, a good space where we, can, where we can be socially somewhat distant, but still eat tacos and enjoy each other's company. 5.30 tacos, you don't wanna miss that. And then seven, we come in here for our, our service, uh, the Stations of the Cross in which we dramatically portray, work through Jesus' final days leading up to the crucifixion. Then, the most high, holy uh, celebration of the year, Easter Sunday, uh, 11 a.m., celebration. It's a, it's a great family service. Uh, it's really hopping service. It moves quickly. The sermon is fairly brief, and it's just a good time for us as a family biologically and church family for us as a family to celebrate the goodness of God on Easter Sunday morning. It's 11 a.m. of course on Easter Sunday. So that's the calendar. I want you to start uh, praying about those services. I want you to be, be excited about the, the, the taco bar and the, the Good Friday service. I want you to invite your friends to eat tacos and come hear a, a good message, a relevant message. I, I want you to be praying for me and, and the team as we get the service together and pick out all the music and, and rehearse and get ready to do a good job. And if you would like to volunteer, if you'd like to help in this master plan, it's going to take a small army to, to make it all happen, then, then you, you should contact Billy Garza, Pastor Billy Garza, our associate pastor, and he will get you on the right team so that you can volunteer and make it all happen. All right, it's been good to be with you today, guys. Hey, if you want to give, now is a good time to give. Uh, you can go online to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and click that giving button. It's safe and intuitive, and, and it's the only way that we can continue this ministry here. So, so don't stop. Many of you have been very generous this year. Continue to do so. Go to the website and give. Um, speaking of the website, if you have any questions about River Church, go there. Everything River Church can be found at riverchurchrgv.com. If you need some help, if you need some prayer, if you need to connect with somebody, reach out to us, the elders at River Church. You can do that by, by sending me uh, an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and that will be, uh, then I can, I can let the other pastors, the other elders know, and we will pray for you, and we will help you in any way we can. All right. I love you. I miss you. I look forward to seeing you again real soon. You have a great day.